This is the third video in the series. As a quick review, Section 951 Cap A requires every 10% or more U.S. shareholder of a CFC to include in his income every year after 2017 the aggregate of income of his CFCs in excess of 10% return on assets. This inclusion is in addition to subpart F inclusions, but is calculated by excluding subpart F income. In this video, I'll provide an example calculation. 951 Cap A inclusions are after tax amounts. Foreign income taxes reduce the income subject to 951 Cap A. Corporate shareholders of a CFC can get a deemed paid foreign tax credit for these taxes flowing with the 951 Cap A inclusion. This deemed paid credit is also available to individuals making a Section 962 election. If the foreign tax credit is chosen, the 951 Cap A inclusion is grossed up for the portion of tax allocated to the inclusion. Section 960 tells how the taxes flow, and new subsection D tells how to apportion income tax among 951 Cap A and other income. This allocation and apportionment is done partly at the CFC level and partly at the shareholder level. First, at the CFC level, income taxes are allocated to income on which foreign law imposes the tax. The income and tax amounts are determined under U.S. tax law, but the incidence of tax must be analyzed under the foreign law. Where a particular foreign income tax is imposed on both 951 Cap A and other income, the tax must be apportioned based on the ratio of 951 Cap A net income and total net income, both determined under U.S. principles. These taxes are then allocated among the shareholders the same way the income is for the 951 Cap A net inclusion. Then, once each CFC's taxes are allocated, each shareholder calculates his aggregate of such taxes. Then multiply this amount of tax by 80% and his inclusion percentage. The result is potentially creditable foreign income tax. The excess of the aggregate tax over this amount is lost forever. The inclusion percentage is the ratio of the net inclusion after reduction for the 10% amount over the aggregate of his share of positive CFC net incomes. The shareholder's income is increased by a higher amount under Section 78. The increase is determined without regard to the 20% reduction in tax under that 80% rule. Here's an example to show how these deemed paid credit rules work for 951 Cap A inclusions. Let's assume our shareholder owns all of three CFCs. Each has positive book income under local accounting rules, but for one there are timing differences for U.S. tax rules that reduce its income to a loss. Each of the subs pays foreign income tax on its local income. Each has different amounts of assets and different 10% amounts. Note that for CFC 2, I have followed the proposed regulations and not included the 10% amount since it has a loss for U.S. purposes. Pause and take a moment to understand these figures. 951 Cap A calculates the net inclusion by reducing the positive amounts by the negative amounts. Under the general principles of Section 316, no taxes flow with the negatives. New Section 960D reinforces that view and reduces creditable tax for amounts from the negative CFCs. 960D imposes two further reductions on creditable taxes. The first is the 80% amount. Only 80% of the taxes have any chance of credits. The others go away. Next, the 80% of taxes flowing with the positives is reduced by the ratio of the 951 Cap A amount, 170, to the total positives of 300. This ratio is called the inclusion ratio. 
The bottom line is that while 330 of taxes flow out, only 150 can be used as credits. Further, since U.S. tax is only 87, the credit is limited to 87. The balance is lost forever immediately. There's worse. Section 904 was amended to provide for two key things on 951 Cap A. First, there's a separate basket for the FTC limitation. Second, there is no carryover of excess credits for this basket. As you can see in our example, of the 360 foreign taxes potentially available as credits, 30 carry over as still undistributed in CFC2. This means the effective tax rate of the CFC's income exceeds the statutory 30% rate in the foreign countries. I mentioned earlier the chance for manipulation and wild swings in assets. Let's look at that possibility here. CFC 3 had 600 of assets and 30 of foreign taxes. If we can find a way to push its income just 200,000 lower, we can save the 30 of foreign taxes from extinction, but at the cost of reducing the asset base and increasing the inclusion. Let's see what happens. We had a zero net increase in tax before. Here's what it looks like if we push CFC 3's income down. CFC 3 does indeed drop out and available credits go down. Deemed paid credits go down, distorting our true picture. While you would think the savings is the difference in permanently lost credits, that's not quite right. We eat up some of the otherwise lost credits, keeping U.S. tax at zero. But we preserve that 30 of tax from CFC 3. Have a look again side by side. This example intentionally uses CFCs in high tax countries, which distorts the loss of credits. Where the income is all in very low tax countries, it will be possible in some cases to have net U.S. tax after all credits. Everything is in the details. Planning for 951 Cap A inclusions and FTC utilization is important. Remember, dividends from these subs would be tax-free even if they were in zero-tax countries. We want to avoid 951 Cap A, which gives us only half tax-free with a very limited foreign tax credit. Again, everything is in the details. For a corporation, the story ends after this example for the earnings and profits of CFC1 and CFC3. Those earnings are previously taxed and excluded from income when distributed. I mentioned that individuals may make an election under Section 962 to compute their current year tax on 951 Cap A and Subpart F inclusions as if they were a corporation. As such, they get the Section 250 deduction and the deemed paid credits. The example would apply in such case. An individual, though, does not get the previously taxed income treatment on earnings of a CFC when there is a 962 election. Instead, the additional U.S. income tax, if any, reduces the E&P. Thus, an individual owning the CFCs in the example would still have 330 minus 87 of income to pick up later when CFC1 and CFC3 distribute their earnings. As you can imagine, properly treating distributions will require a lot of tracking of the differences in treatment of parts of 951 Cap A, Subpart F, and regular earnings. The IRS issued a notice in March 2019 saying they would propose using 16 categories of earnings that must be tracked, and each separately, for each year. So we're back to vintage accounts with baskets, sort of a combination of the nightmares of pre-87 and post-86. This leads to increased risks of permanently trapped taxes beyond those I showed in the example. The fourth video will discuss 
miscellaneous small items, and provide some of my thoughts on implementation.